Welcome to Compare to Who, the podcast to help you stop comparing and start living. I'm your host, Heather Creekmore. I hate to admit this, but I used to secretly obsess over my appearance. I thought it was part of my job as a woman to always look better, but never felt like I could be good enough. Maybe you can relate. But God, in His grace, He showed me a way out, and I want to give you all the tools you need to break free, too. If you've ever spent too much time stressing over your looks, I get it. I hope you'll keep listening and find the same freedom I have. Here are three other things you need to know about me. I'm a minivan driving mom of four elementary age kids. I'm author of the book Compared to Who and a blogger at comparedtowho.me. And you just may have seen my epic bake fail on Netflix. If you've ever struggled with comparison or body image issues, Compared to Who is the show for you. I hope you enjoy today's episode and tell a friend about it. Hey there, friend. Welcome to Compare to Who the Podcast. I'm Heather Creekmore, your host, and today we are going to talk about one of my favorite topics. We're going to talk about comparison. Okay, so if I'm honest, I lived a life of comparison for many, many, many decades. And I think I'm going out on a limb here, but I think that there are a lot of women in this country have a similar struggle. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe that's why you're tuning in today. See, part of the problem with comparison is it affects so many of us, but we don't really think it's dangerous. I don't know. Maybe you've already discovered that it's dangerous. But for me, I thought that those comparative thoughts that I had were just things that went on in my head and they weren't really hurting anyone. But that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, comparison not only harms us personally, but it harms those around us, those we want to be in relationship with. So today what we're going to talk about are some of those dangers of comparison and then how you can find a way out. Okay, I'm oversimplifying it a little bit because I wrote a whole book on body image with a whole chapter on comparison, so I still hope that you'll check that out. But for today, we're going to just kind of take the aerial view, if you will, on the issue and talk about a couple of the big ways that comparison hurts us. And then I'll give you one great analogy for why and how you can get out of comparison's trap. So there's an author, her name is Sonia Libomirsky, and I really hope I'm saying that right. My apologies, Sonia, if I got it wrong. But she makes an interesting observation. Let me read you what she says. She's a researcher, and here's what she's observed. We found that the happiest people take pleasure in other people's successes and show concern in the face of others' failures. A completely different portrait, however, has emerged of a typical unhappy person, namely as someone who is deflated rather than delighted about his peers' accomplishments and triumphs, and who is relieved rather than sympathetic in the face of his peers' failures and undoings. Okay, so there was a lot of words there, but essentially what they found, okay, I don't know what her faith is, but she's just a researcher who's been observing happiness, the difference between happy people and unhappy people. And essentially they found that happy people are happy when their friends succeed and they're sad when their friends fail. Whereas unhappy people are more your typical comparers, right? When their friend doesn't get that promotion or doesn't get engaged like she thought she would, or doesn't get pregnant like she hopes she would, they're secretly happy. They're secretly relieved that their friends didn't get that next thing, especially if it's a thing that they themselves wanted. Friends, this is dangerous. The life of comparison is dangerous because it makes us unhappy. And we just did an episode on joy. The last episode was on joy, so you can go listen to that one if you haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. But joyful lives are are so much more restful and peaceful than unhappy lives are. So my first point for you today is that we need to stop comparing so we can find joy. I mean, it's an old cliche. Some people have attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt. I'm not exactly sure who said it, but comparison is the thief of joy. I'm sure you've heard it, seen it on a meme, shared it on social media. But it really is true, friends. You cannot be joyful and comparing yourself to others at the same time. So that's reason number one why we need to cut out comparison. Reason number two, though, 
is a little bit more personal, at least for me. So I thought my comparison issues were bad before I got married when I was a single woman. But after I got married, somehow, some way, they got even worse. You see, I kept comparing myself to other women around me. And after I was married, I realized, oh no, my husband is going to see all these other women who are prettier, hotter, you name it, than I am. And he's not going to love me anymore. Now, he didn't do anything to make me think, feel, or believe that, but the crazy going on in my head, and some of you know what I mean, you have crazy going on in your head too, but the crazy going on in my head said, oh, he's going to see those women. Oh, he's going to think that you're fatter than she is. He's going to think you're not as pretty as she is, and he's going to stop loving you. So... Uh, Now, remember, I said I was crazy. Um, I would do a totally silly thing. I mean, if we were driving down the highway and we saw a billboard with a picture of a woman in a bikini on it, I would be like, hey, uh, look over there, pointing in the other direction, just to try to distract him so he wouldn't see that woman. I mean, I would try to keep the TV remote control as much as I could, although it was a hard battle, but I'd try to have the remote in my hands. So if a beer commercial came on with a bunch of women in bikinis, I could turn the channel real quick. I thought, that I could win somehow my comparison battle if I could just stop him from seeing all other beautiful women. Okay, so it was crazy. Um, And I'm really, really grateful that I married a compassionate and generous man who put up with all of my antics. But Here's the truth, friends. When we live a life of comparison, it separates us from other people. So if you're married and you're always comparing yourself to other people, maybe you're comparing your marriage. Okay, so that's another area that I totally messed up in. We were on our honeymoon, you guys. And I remember saying these words to my husband. It's not supposed to be this way. And he'd be like, how do you know? And I'd be like, well, because I know that, you know, this couple's honeymoon was like this and this couple's honeymoon was like this and this is not how it's supposed to be. And he would remind me over and again that I truly didn't know how other people's marriages were. That the only thing I knew about other people's marriages or other people's honeymoons were what they had told me about them. And so we had a big fight on our honeymoon, a fight that was really over something silly and it was probably mostly my fault. But oh, for some reason, I just thought I had been wounded and maybe I had made a huge mistake getting married. And I remember going into the bathroom and sitting on the cold tile bathroom floor of our hotel in Hawaii and just sobbing, being so sad that maybe, maybe I had done something wrong. Maybe um, if I was prettier, my husband would love me more and he would do what I wanted him to do. I had all kinds of crazy logical riddles going on in my head about what had caused our little fight, but I was just tragically upset about it. But part of the reason why I was most upset about it was because I didn't think that people fought on their honeymoons. I believed that none of my friends fought on their honeymoons and that because we had a fight, we had a bad honeymoon. I was comparing myself to all the other couples around me without really having all the information about how their honeymoons went. So here's the ironic part of the story. I got home and I was talking to one of my friends and I was like, you know, honeymoon was okay. I said, I feel really bad because we had a fight and, you know, told her what happened. Her response was, oh, that's nothing. We had a huge fight. In fact, my husband went down to the lobby and spent the night sitting on a couch in the lobby because we were so angry with each other. And I was so frustrated, you guys. I was like, are you serious? Why didn't you tell me that before? Like, if you had told me that before our honeymoon, I would have realized that having a fight on your honeymoon is not that big of a deal. And I would have felt better. And I probably wouldn't have been sobbing on the bathroom floor about our little disagreement. And she said, well, you know, I didn't think you needed to know. I didn't want to discourage you. But friends, it was such a good reminder for me that we don't really know what other people's relationships are like. So not only can we not compare ourselves to other wives or other moms or other women in general, but we can't compare our relationships to the relationships of other people because we have no idea what really goes on behind their bedroom doors. And and that's kind of all part of my larger point here, which is comparison takes a toll on our relationships. I can't tell you how many times during our first year of marriage that my husband and I had that same conversation where I said, no, marriage isn't supposed to be like this. 
it's supposed to be like this. And he would say, well, how do you know? And I would say, well, because such and such as marriage isn't like this and their marriage isn't like this. And again, he would say, how do you know? And I would just kind of get angry and in a huff be like, oh, I just know. But friends, I was wrong. I was wrong. And it hurt our marriage for a long time until I could see the truth that There was no way I could compare what we had to what anyone else had. God has each of our relationships on a different journey. Some of us have what they call a honeymoon year, right? Like, I didn't even feel like we had a honeymoon week, okay? Not that we fought a lot, but just I never, we got married when we were a little bit older. We were in our early 30s, and I never felt like I had this euphoric, like, walking on air, lovey-dovey, like, we're just on a high kind of relationship with my husband. We're just, we're not that kind of people. We're both pretty logical, rational, like grounded people. And so maybe that was part of it. But I'll be honest with you, I had heard of that kind of honeymoon aura and from other couples, and I was a little disappointed. And again, I thought, well, maybe I'm doing something wrong, or maybe we've got this wrong. Maybe I married the wrong person, or something's wrong with me. It should be different. And again, it was just all comparison, really draining the joy out of my first year of marriage, draining the joy out of my honeymoon. So comparison can hurt our relationships in that way, but comparison can also hurt our relationships in another way. I got a letter from a woman a couple years ago, and it said that she was really, really frustrated because she had prayed and asked God not to let a beautiful woman move in across the street from her. The house across the street was for sale, and she was waiting to see who would move in and had specifically asked God to keep it from being a beautiful woman. And well, wouldn't you know it, a beautiful woman with a successful career moved in across the street. And so her note to me was, what am I supposed to do? This woman is ruining my marriage. Those were her words. Um, And I don't know how I'm going to compete with that. She has a great job. She's beautiful. She's tan. She's 5'10". She looks like she could be a model. And I'm not. And I just had two kids. And uh, my body is not what it used to be. And how can I compete with all that? And now all that is living right across the street from me. And the crazy thing, folks, is like this woman hadn't made any advances towards her husband at all. Her husband hadn't been like, you know, gawking out the window waiting for this woman to, you know, walk out of her house. There was no tangible evidence that anything inappropriate was going on between her husband and this woman. In fact, in a conversation that we had kind of back and forth, I asked her, I said, has your husband even noticed her? Like, is this something he's brought up? Or is this just something that you're kind of projecting on him because of your fear? And she was like, yeah, you know, he hasn't really said anything, but he does get really angry with me every time I bring it up. And that kind of made me laugh a little bit because I don't know about you, but I know that when I've accused my husband unjustly, uh, after a number of times, he does get rather frustrated. So I totally got that. Here, I mean, in a way, friends, like, just think about this poor guy. His wife's gone really nuts, so believing that he is going to leave her or have an affair with the woman across the street, and the guy hasn't done anything. So I don't know if you've ever done anything like that, uh, or if those thoughts have come into your head. Maybe you haven't acted on them, or you haven't sent me an email about them. But friends, it happens, right? Like the wheels start turning. And too many times, we don't control our thoughts, right? We let those wheels start turning. What if... What would happen if, oh, did he just see that woman? Oh, I bet he's thinking about that woman. I bet he's still thinking about her. Six hours later, when maybe your husband wants to be intimate, you remember that time from six hours before and you think, oh, he doesn't really want to be intimate with me. He's thinking about that woman that was on the television six hours ago and and this isn't about me. This is about her and no way I'm going to just say no tonight. Friends, we, we can't do that. We got to stop it. We're not saving or protecting our marriages or other relationships by doing that. We're just bringing them harm. So here's what I want you to do. If comparison is affecting your marriage, I want you to just do a little inventory. Okay. You might not be able to write this down right now, especially if you're driving. That's totally fine. But I just want you to stop and think just for a second. Are there ways that I am comparing myself to other women that are affecting my relationship? Are there ways that I'm comparing myself to other moms 
and feeling inadequate or insufficient. And then that's actually affecting my parenting where I'm getting more angry with my children because they're not acting like her kids acted in the beautiful picture she had on Instagram of what happened when they baked together or whatever your thing is. Are you comparing yourself to other women and projecting those issues into your marriage? Are you comparing your marriage to the marriage of other people? Do you look at someone else's husband and think, wow, he's a really great husband. He treats her really well. I wish my loser of a husband would do that. Friends, if you are having those thoughts, they are all dangerous, dangerous, dangerous thoughts. Comparison is a marriage killer. If you want to destroy your marriage, keep comparing. But if you want to improve your marriage, own it, my friend, own it. Stop an inventory right now. What ways am I comparing? And then just ask God to help. Ask him to forgive you. In some ways, you guys, this is going to be hard. But after you pray and ask God to help, you need to go to that person. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's a friend um, that you're comparing yourself with. But you need to go to that person. You need to confess it. Just say to your husband, hey, you know what? I compare our marriage to their marriage too much, and that's not fair. It's not fair to you, and it's not fair to us, and I know it's not helpful for our marriage. Will you forgive me for doing this? Oh, friends, I mean, if your husband's anything like mine, the expression on his face, although it's going to be scary to say those words, the expression on his face will make it all worth it because so many men are just relieved when they hear their wives finally come to the point where they recognize that they don't have to try to keep their marriage up with anyone else's marriage, that it's okay to do your own thing, to be uh, on your own pace. And to do marriage the way that God designed it for the two of you, not for the two of them or the two of them. So free yourselves from that bondage of comparison today. Confess it. Confess it to your husband. um, And really experience how much joy there is once you're able to be in relationships without that added burden of comparison. body image been bogging you down for too long, it's time to get free. My friend, go to compare to who.me, take your free body image awareness quiz. You will learn amazing things. You'll get your results right away. And I think you'll have fun too, because I mean, who doesn't love to take quizzes? Go to compare to who.me. There's lots of great resources on that site, articles about body image and comparison and how you can find freedom through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Check it out today, right after this episode, of course. Okay, so I mentioned real briefly, let me go one more relationship, comparison on our friendships. Oh, when I talk to women, there's always one woman that they're able to name as a friend, or sometimes it's a sister or a relative whom they've always compared themselves to. Friends, if this is you, Can I just encourage you to write that name down, to give yourself some accountability, write that name down, and then (laughs) confess to the father that you've been comparing your journey to her journey and that you've been discontent. Maybe you've been covetous of things that God's blessed her with, talents, or maybe the way she looks, or her marriage, or children, or, or whatever. Maybe it's covetousness that you need to confess, or jealousy. But whatever it is, I want you to stop and just grab hold of that comparison because it's hurting your relationship with that other woman. One thing I've also noticed is a lot of women compare themselves to a woman that they don't even know. So maybe it's a woman who sings up front every week at your church, or maybe it's a celebrity, or a woman that you just really admire. And in your head, you find yourself constantly saying, oh, if I was more like her than this, or, you know, if I could just pull off looking like she does every Sunday morning, you know, then uh, I'd have a better experience at church or whatever your thing may be. So here's what I would encourage you to do if that's you. I would encourage you, if possible, to get to know a little better the woman that you're comparing yourself to. Here's why. I think whenever we know someone's full story, 
it allows us to more clearly distinguish between the truth and the lie. You see, the lie is that this person that you're comparing yourself to has a better life because they have that thing you want. Maybe um, let's let's go with body image. Let's say that woman has the body you want, and you look at her every Sunday, and you're like, "Oh, if I could just have abs like that and arms like that, oh, that would be so awesome." But I bet what will happen is as you get to know this person, you may start to recognize that their life isn't quite as perfect as you thought. Now, it's going to take some effort on your part to really dig into their story and find out that truth. And I'm not saying you want to dig up dirt on these people. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what we often do is we idolize that woman, right? We we start to assume, oh, well, she's got the body that I want, so she must have a perfect marriage. Her husband must want to be with her all the time and must gush over her and bring her flowers for no reason all the time. And our kids must be perfectly obedient. She just must have this perfect life because she has this perfect body. But as you get to know someone a little deeper, Deeper, what you'll find is that it's not true, right? Yeah, sure, she's got a great body, but that doesn't mean everything else in her life is super smooth. That's one thing I like to encourage women to do. So, so many times we're checking out of Target or grocery store or wherever, and you see those magazines. And we see this magazine covers, what do we all want to do? And we're like, ugh, please, I don't want to see that woman in the bikini. That is not helpful for me. Some of us get frustrated and we're stress eaters, so we grab a bag of M&Ms and we throw it onto the conveyor belt because we're just like, ugh, I'll never look like that, so might as well eat more M&Ms. Um, but what we fail to do, we see those images, but what we fail to do is we fail to read the headlines around those women with the bodies that we wish we had. How many times do those headlines around those women say things like why she struggled with depression or how she almost ended it all or how she dealt with him cheating, right? These women, Hollywood celebrities, even with perfect bodies, experience great trauma and trials in their lives. And it should be a reminder to us all that even the perfect body doesn't really get us anything more than a good body, right? It doesn't mean that everything else in life is charmed. So why should you stop comparing? You should stop comparing because it's hurting your relationships, but you should also stop comparing because it's just believing a lie. And if you want to know more about that, I talk about that in episodes one and two of this podcast, talk about body image idolatry. So go listen to those and you'll learn more about what I mean by it's a lie, but it's a lie. Comparison tells us a lie. So how do we cure comparison? Well, there's a lot of theories out there, even in Christian book land, about comparison and whether or not it really can be cured. I read one book that suggested that you just wish your comparison away, like, you know, self-talk, uh, things like, I'm really happy for her, uh, and eventually you'll stop comparing. I don't, I don't really buy any of that. You see, I think the real cure for comparison is found at the airport. I was going to a conference with my husband a few years ago, and we are both type A's, and so we were super early for our flight, and we're just sitting at the airport in Dallas, Texas, staring at the gate, you know, waiting, (laughs) waiting for our turn to board. And as I was sitting there, I was watching people walk through the concourse, and I noticed something about all of them. They all walked with determination. They're all kind of looking at the various gates just to read the gate number, the gate name, you know, C4, C3. But people weren't lingering at each gate. They're not walking through the concourse, stomach at the gate saying, C4, oh, Miami, yeah, I'd like to go there. No. They're walking through the airport with determination. Why? Well, because they have a boarding pass. And that boarding pass has on it what gate they're supposed to go to in order to catch their flight. Would it help any of those travelers to stop at C4, my gate, and say, oh, well, Miami. You know, my boarding pass says Michigan, but I really think I would enjoy going to Miami more. So I'll just hang out here, and when the flight comes, I'll just hop on it. It doesn't work, does it? Especially after 9-11. Like, there's no way you're getting on that airplane to Miami if your boarding pass says Michigan. So friends, I think our cure for comparison, the way we can stop walking through the airport of life, looking around at each gate, wondering if maybe that should be our destination, and instead walk through with a determination like people at the airport do, where they're headed straight for their gate and only their gate because they know that's the only flight they can get on. I think that's our cure for comparison. 
You see, we need to know what is written on our boarding pass. We need to know what our destination is. And once we know what our unique destination is, then we have the freedom to walk through life without looking around at where everyone else is going and feeling bad. Without saying, oh, supermodels, boy, maybe I need to look like a supermodel so I can be a supermodel. No, if your boarding pass doesn't say supermodel, honey, you don't have any reason why you need to be five foot 11 and 100 pounds, okay? If God made you that way, awesome. Maybe you should look into modeling. But if he didn't, stop beating yourself up over the fact that you don't look like a supermodel and take confidence in the truth that God gave you everything you need physically to accomplish his purpose for your life. Maybe he didn't give you the build of a supermodel, but maybe he doesn't want you to do any modeling. Maybe instead he gave you a heart of compassion to serve people in need. Maybe he gave you fast fingers to type blog posts to encourage other people. The possibilities are endless, but I promise you, friend, God gave you what you need to accomplish your purpose. And so if you can just figure out what that purpose is, you will be free from comparing yourself to others. Now, some of you have small kids, or even if you don't have small kids, you've got a really busy life, maybe you've got a really busy job, and you're like, yeah, figure out my purpose. I'll have time to do that in 2027. Um, How am I supposed to do that? Well, don't make it so overwhelming, okay? It doesn't have to be a daunting task. There are easy ways that you can start to discover God's purpose for your life just by taking small steps. That's all the time we have for today, but we're going to talk about how to take those small steps and how to really break out of that comparison trap by finding God's purpose for your life in the next episode. I hope to see you there. 